Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture on oxidative phosphorylation. Now, just a reminder, after each of the slides, you're going to see a chalkboard note slide so that you can pause the video and jot down some notes. So when we talk about oxidative phosphorylation, you'll hear the term chemiosmotic theory or chemiosmosis. Just like in our previous lesson, this is one of the pathways or, or processes that occurs in the mitochondria. And ultimately, the goal will be to produce ATP because, you know, you want that energy. In this case, the production of ATP will be driven by the movement of protons down a concentration gradient. So if something is going down a concentration gradient, that means that the protons are going to be moving from high concentration to low concentration. And you're going to see later on that there will be a protein complex called ATP synthase that will then be responsible for the production of ATP. Now, when we talk about oxidative phosphorylation and chemiosmotic theory, you see the term electron transport chain, or sometimes you'll see it written as the ETC or electron transport system as well. And you're going to see that over here. It's basically a series of four complexes, so four proteins that are embedded in the mitochondrial membrane. Uh, you have complex one, two, three, and four. And then after that, which is not shown in this picture, you're going to see the ATP synthase that I was just talking about a moment ago. And sometimes they call that complex five. And what the electron transport chain is going to be doing is it will be a series of combined redox reactions as you're passing electrons from different parts of the electron transport chain. And just a reminder, again, redox means reduction and oxidation. So where one part of that reaction is gaining electrons and the other one in the reaction is losing electrons. Okay, so that's what we mean by redox. Now, speaking of redox, you're going to see two very important things occurring in the electron transport chain. Uh, over here, you see that NADH is going to be oxidized to form NAD+. And over here, you're going to see that oxygen is going to be reduced to form water. And we're going to talk about these things later on as we go through each of the steps in the electron transport chain. Again, just a reminder, we have the chalkboard notes that you'll be able to pause and jot down the notes that would have been on the chalkboard for the previous slides. This slide is just to summarize for you, again, the fact that you are going to see four complexes in this lesson. We're going to go over each of them, the four complexes of the electron transport chain. And then right after that, what you see over here is you will have the ATP synthase, which is a lot of times called complex five. Okay, so you have the electron transport chain and then the ATP synthase, and ultimately you get the production of ATP. Now we're going to go through each of those complexes one by one. The first complex of the electron transport chain, you have the name right over here. It's the NADH ubiquinone oxidoreductase. And for that one, it's going to catalyze the first step of the electron transport chain, which will basically be the transfer of electrons from NADH to coenzyme Q, also known as CoQ. Okay, and so when you look at this title or this name of the complex, it's showing that you are getting the transfer of electrons from NADH to ubiquinone, which is the other name for CoQ, okay, coenzyme Q. And in this process, what you're going to see is that since NADH is losing electrons or giving them to the ubiquinone, NADH is being oxidized. And the ubiquinone, or coenzyme Q, is getting reduced. Because again, always remind yourself, Leo says GER. Okay, so lose electrons, which is in this case is NADH, that will be oxidized. 
and gain electrons, which is coenzyme Q or ubiquinone, that's going to be reduced. And you will see that carriers along the way to, to transfer the electrons are in the form of FMN, which stands for flavin mononucleotides. And in the beginning right here, you see that the FMN is accepting two electrons from NADH, and then it's passing it through a chain of iron sulfide uh, carriers to ultimately make it to the transfer to CoQ, coenzyme Q, ubiquinone, whatever you want to call that. It all means the same thing. Now, an important part of that first complex, as we saw a moment ago, was the FMN, which again stands for flavin mononucleotides. They're a form of vitamin B2, and ultimately they can be reduced one electron at a time. And that basically means that they're, they're able to serve as carriers passing along these electrons from NADH to the ubiquinone, to that, you know, CoQ ubiquinone. Now, if they are the ones that are accepting the electrons, so they're gaining electrons, while the um, NADH is losing the electrons, then we say that they are oxidizing the NADH. Okay, so they are what's responsible for helping that NADH to lose the electrons and to transfer ultimately those electrons to the ubiquinone. Now, we keep mentioning coenzyme Q. Again, you'll hear the other names of CoQ. Sometimes you'll just see it as the letter Q by itself, or you'll see it as ubiquinone. All of these terms mean the same thing, okay? So coenzyme Q, the other name is ubiquinone, Q, or CoQ. Any of these terms, again, all referring to the same thing, ultimately mean a mobile electron carrier Okay, and it's going to be very important in the electron transport chain because it's going to transport electrons from complex one ultimately to complex three. So you're going to see it pop up in both complex one and complex two to eventually transfer electrons to what's called cytochrome C that, you know, we're going to talk about more in a moment. That's part of complex three. Okay, so whenever you see coenzyme Q, think also its other name, ubiquinone, and think of it as an electron carrier that is passing electrons from complex one and ultimately to complex three, okay, because it's part of complex one and complex two, transferring electrons ultimately to cytochrome C in complex three. This will become clear in a moment when we get to the next complexes in the electron transport chain. Okay, so now we are on complex two of the electron transport chain. Each time you'll see that the complex name is written at the top of the figure. So complex number two is the succinate dehydrogenase. And you will notice that you should recognize succinate from previous lessons, and that is because it's part of the citrate cycle, okay? And so you see the overlap here of the citrate cycle and the electron transport chain directly. Uh, circle star highlight the fact that succinate is part of both. It is part of the citrate cycle and the electron transport chain, okay? This complex, this second complex, what it's going to be doing is it's going to catalyze the transfer of electrons to coenzyme Q, just like we saw in the first complex, but the difference here is the source of those electrons. So in the first complex, we saw electrons were transferred from NADH to coenzyme Q. So we had NADH down here, and ultimately the transfer was to coenzyme Q. Now in complex two, you have succinate being responsible for the transfer of electrons to coenzyme Q. 
Okay, so coenzyme Q is collecting electrons in complex one and complex two. That way, ultimately, it can then transfer them in complex three, which we're going to see in a moment. Okay, so in this step, you have the oxidation of succinate and ultimately the reduction of coenzyme Q. Again, because succinate here is the one losing electrons, coenzyme Q is the one gaining electrons. So always remind yourself, Leo says GER. Okay, so now we are up to complex number three and if you recap what's happened so far, you notice that in complex one and complex two, Q, also known as ubiquinone, kept getting reduced, meaning that it kept gaining electrons. And so that's why you see it here written as QH2, because it was reduced, it was gaining electrons. So now in complex three, which is the ubiquinone cytochrome C oxidoreductase, okay, you are going to have the transfer of electrons from that ubiquinone, that reduced uh, coenzyme Q, to cytochrome C. Okay, so they're both docking at complex three. And so now, if you think about it, in the first two complexes, Q, or ubiquinone, got reduced. Now, since it is going to lose those electrons that it gained and give them to cytochrome C, so now in complex three, what's happening to ubiquinone? Okay, now it's getting oxidized. Okay, so in complex three, you have the oxidation of um, that reduced, the, that previously reduced version of coenzyme Q. Okay, so the electrons here are going to be passed through an iron sulfur cluster, just like we saw in the previous slides when you see that FES in the the, the center of the big protein that tells you it's an iron sulfur carrier. And so you get the transfer of electron from the reduced Q. So that, that is now getting oxidized. And the transfer of electrons is from ubiquinone to cytochrome C. Now, something important with complex number three is that complex three has what's called the Q cycle. So please make sure on this slide to write down that complex three has the Q cycle. And what the Q cycle basically is referring to is the fact that coenzyme Q, which, you know, again, is ubiquinone, has the ability to repeatedly accept electrons from one complex and donate them to another complex, which is why you saw complex Q as a major player in complex one, in complex two, and then again now in complex three. So it's able to grab electrons in complex one from NADH. It's able to grab electrons from complex two from succinate, and then in complex three, it's able to give those electrons to cytochrome C, okay? So that is the Q cycle. The fact that the ubiquinone is a major carrier, it's a major player in the transfer of electrons back and forth from the different complexes. Now, we mentioned cytochrome C a minute ago in complex three, and so I wanna take a moment to show you what exactly is meant by cytochromes. Now, circle star highlight the fact that cytochromes are conjugated proteins containing heme. Now, heme, so we have, have it written out here, type A, type B heme, type C heme. Uh, Heme is something that we've discussed before in biochemistry and a lot of the biology classes. You usually see it when we talk about hemoglobin and myoglobin in the body, and both of those are responsible for using their iron ion uh, in their center of the heme to bind oxygen. Now, 
what you will notice with cytochromes is that they contain the heme, so they have that iron center, but in the case of cytochromes, they are not binding oxygen. Okay, make sure to circle star highlight that in your notes that cytochromes are not binding oxygen with their heme. Instead, they are binding electrons because their iron is involved in a series of redox reactions. So that's why cytochrome C was able to grab the electrons from the ubiquinone and then it's able to pass it on to the next stage in the, the electron transport system. Okay, so please make sure you know the difference between hemoglobin and myoglobin's version of heme versus the function of heme in cytochromes. Okay, similar structure, they both have the iron in the center, but very different function we have here. So now that brings us to the last of our four complexes of the electron transport chain. This one is called the cytochrome C oxidase. Okay, so we have it written here, cytochrome C oxidase. I'm going to keep recapping what's happened so far. It's important for you to kind of keep track of, of where the electrons have been transferred. So again, in complex one, you had the transfer of electrons from NADH to ubiquinone. Then in complex two, you had the transfer of electrons from succinate, which you also saw in the citrate cycle, and the electrons went from succinate to ubiquinone as well. Then in complex three, the ubiquinone gave up those electrons and passed them to cytochrome C. Again, remember the difference between cytochrome C versus hemoglobin and myoglobin is it's binding electrons instead of oxygen. Now you have complex four. So now cytochrome C is going to transfer those electrons through the carriers of the complex and ultimately pass them to oxygen. Okay, and that tells you that cytochrome C is losing electrons, Leo, so losing electrons, it's getting oxidized, and it's giving them to oxygen. And since oxygen is gaining electrons, that means GER, gaining electrons, oxygen is getting reduced. And if you remember at the very beginning, we mentioned that when oxygen is reduced in this scenario, it is forming water, okay? So oxygen is getting reduced to water in this final uh, complex of the electron transport chain. And it's important to note that since you have oxygen as a player in this complex, that is why you can think of the process as aerobic. So remember that uh, citrate cycle and the electron transport chain and ATP synthase they're all part of aerobic respiration. So now earlier we said the purpose of this whole process is to produce ATP, but notice you haven't seen any ATP produced yet when we were talking about the electron transport chain. So that now brings us to what we call complex five and that is the ATP synthase complex. And what you will notice with this complex is that it is made up of two different subunits, okay, two structural subunits. We have the F sub zero and the F sub one portions of this ATP synthase. And here it shows a bacterial versus a eukaryotic ATP synthase. And when you look at these two structural components, First, we have the F sub zero portion here, and that portion is embedded in the membrane. If it's bacterial, it's the cell membrane here. If it is eukaryotic, you have it in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And that portion is acting as the proton channel. So you see the protons able to cross the membrane based on that channel there. Then you have the F sub one portion, and this portion will encode the catalytic activity 
of this enzyme and you notice that's where you see the actual ATP production and we're going to talk about in a moment how that's actually occurring. Now before we look at exactly how that ATP synthase is producing ATP, I just want you to be aware of two terms. So circle, star, highlight these terms and make sure you know the definitions. The first term that you see here is chemiosmotic coupling. And chemiosmotic coupling, that basically just means the coupling of electron transport to oxidative phosphorylation. And you know that requires a proton gradient across that inner mitochondrial membrane that we mentioned a moment ago. And ultimately, you can look at it as this coupling is a direct relationship between the proton gradient and ATP synthesis. OK, so for that definition, know it as a direct relationship between the proton gradient and ATP synthesis. The next term that I want you to know is ionophores. So circle star highlight that term. That simply means any substance that will create channels for ions to pass through the inner mitochondrial membrane or technically any membrane. Okay, so ionophores are any substances that will create a channel for ions to pass through a membrane. An interesting example of ionophores is that some antibiotics are ionophores. Basically, some bacteria will be able to create these ionophore antibiotics that then disrupt ion gradients for, a, for, for their competitor bacteria. And if you do that, if you disrupt how ions are concentrated, you could end up killing these cells. So now, going back to the ATP synthase, we're not going to go into crazy detail about how exactly it's producing ATP, but I'd like you to know that it is based on a conformational coupling. And it's kind of like a turbine kind of moving around and rotating. And what's interesting with this is that you'll see Ultimately, the proton gradient that we kept mentioning so far, it causes conformational changes in uh, a number of proteins, especially the ATP synthase. And ultimately, the ATP synthase will then be able to release ATP as a result of the conformational changes. And this is kind of basically related to how sometimes when you have binding in proteins like this, you end up with conformational states that have different affinities for the substrate. And then that will result in uh, basically catalytic activity and the ultimate spitting out, you can think of it, of a final product. And so what you see here is you see that that binding and rotating process that ultimately leads to the production of ATP and spitting out ATP. And it has multiple sections to this synthase that allows for this, this overall production and this overall rotational movement. Now, I know this slide basically looks very, very scary when you look at these figures, but I'm not going to make you memorize the crazy details of each of these figures. I just wanted to show you that transport systems ultimately end up being very important in the mitochondria because, you know, when you think about all of these processes, you have various biomolecules that are involved in, you know, the transfer of these electrons, for instance, and the intermediates that you're dealing with, with a lot of these pathways in, in biochemistry. 
And so when you are looking at these, these systems, think about it as there are biomolecules required for the electron transport system that we've been talking about and oxidative phosphorylation, and they need to be able to be shuttled back and forth across the membrane. And so the two examples that I have on this slide are the malate aspartate shuttle of the liver. So you can see that here you see uh, malate, malate and aspartate here, and then aspartate to malate here. And so you're able to have this cycling of the, the intermediates here. And then you also, on this side, the other example is the uh, glycerol 3-phosphate cycling that you have in, in muscles. Okay, so you see how you have that cycling going on here to make sure that the biomolecules uh, that are very important to, to the pathways that we've been talking about, that you end up having enough of them where, wherever they're needed at that moment, basically. Now, when we talk about any process, you've noticed that I keep saying how important regulation is. You need to know when to turn something on, and you need to know when to turn something off, basically. Okay, do with that phrasing whatever you will, but, but regulation is ultimately very important. So now with the regulation of oxidative phosphorylation, keep in mind, we talked about two things that are connected today. We talked about the electron transport system and also that ATP synthase complex, which is technically, you know, right next to it, but they're, it's considered separate. So even though it's complex five, we distinguish them as the first four complexes being the electron transport chain and then complex five being ATP synthase. So now for oxidative phosphorylation as a whole, in order to get the ATP at the end and in order to have proper oxidative phosphorylation, it depends on substrates for both the electron transport system and ATP synthase. So if, for instance, you added just ADP plus the, the additional phosph uh, phosphate group, you would not be able to have the overall oxidative phosphorylation because you would need succinate to activate the electron transport system. So even though the ADP portion will activate the ATP synthase, it won't actually do anything without succinate activating electron transport. And then here shows the opposite. If you have succinate, but you don't have ADP, notice you do not have ATP synthesis. Okay, so ATP synthesis is when the graph shoots up. So you need both. So succinate represents what activates or what's the substrate for the electron transport system. And ADP plus P here, that represents the substrate for the ATP synthase, which is complex five. So this portion here just shows that you need both in order to have oxidative phosphorylation. Then over here, we look at inhibitors, okay, inhibitors. And first of all, I want on this one for you to circle star highlight cyanide. Cyanide blocks the electron transport system, okay? Basically, the cyanide ion will bind to that iron atom that we looked at in the heme of cytochrome C earlier, the uh, cyto cytochrome C oxidase, and it will act as an irreversible enzyme inhibitor. Okay, so you notice once cyanide is present, boom, ATP synthesis flatlines. It's been destroyed, okay, because you have irreversibly blocked the electron transport system by having cyanide binding the iron of the uh, cytochrome C oxidase. Over here, you have oligomycin. And oligomycin, so you notice in this one, we block the electron transport chain. In this one, oligomycin is blocking 
ATP synthase. Now the way it does it is it's blocking the proton channel portion of the ATP synthase, but it is not an irreversible binding. And so they're actually what's called uncouplers, such as this one here. So the 2,4-dinitrophenol, that's actually able to, to uncouple or reverse the oligomycin binding to the ATP uh, synthase. So in this case, it's reversible inhibition because notice, once you put that uncoupler there, it gets rid of the oligomycin blocking and boom, the curve goes up. You have ATP, um, sorry, oxygen consumption able to occur again in terms of that the, the um, oxidative phosphorylation process, okay? Okay, so the last point that I want to make is on this slide a few different examples of inherited mitochondrial diseases and you'll notice that different ones can target different parts of the complexes that we talked about today. So some diseases can ta target uh, complex one, some will be uh, dysfunctions in complex three, some for complex four, and then we have here ATP synthase. But if you think about the process as a whole, no matter which portion of this process that we talked about today you are dysregulating or having dysfunction in, ultimately what's going to happen as the main byproduct of this? Well, if you mess up any part of the electron transport system or the ATP synthase complex, what's going to happen? you are not going to end up with proper ATP production. So at the end of any of these diseases, ultimately what you're getting is a decrease in ATP production. And I just want to make note that if you look through a lot of the inherited mitochondrial diseases, you'll notice that most originate in either neuronal cells or in skeletal muscle. Okay, so ultimately any of the diseases that you see on this slide, if it's an inherited mitochondrial disease, the main thing to remember is that you will have a decrease in ATP production. And so now that brings us to this portion here, which are the review questions. As I mentioned last time, please make sure to send me the answers to your review questions. So we have two on this slide and then one on the next slide as well. Please make sure to send me the answers in the Remind app. Again, if you have not logged in or you're not sure where to find the code for that, just double check the syllabus or contact me in email and I'll help you set that up. So here is the last of the review questions for today. Again, please send me the answer in the Remind app. And as I mentioned previously, don't worry about when you're sending it, anytime, day or night. It could be 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. when you happen to be watching the video. Please send it at that moment so that you don't forget to send it to me at a later time, okay? It's not going to wake me up. It's not going to disturb me. And like I always say, I have no life anyway, so don't worry about bothering me because you're not going to bother me. Uh, again, like I mentioned previously, please do not cheat and just send me what your friends told you the answer was because, again, this is not getting graded. This is just for me to be able to help explain certain topics, again, to you one-on-one -on -one in the Remind app if you're having difficulty with them so that it prevents you from making errors on the exams later on. Because notice the questions from the review will not always be in the exact same format on the exams. So if you don't actually understand what the question's asking or the true answer, if it's formed in a different way, you're not going to end up being able to get it correctly. And that is it for today. As always, if you have any questions, please contact me in the Remind app. If you're having trouble with the app, never hesitate to send me an email as well. Okay, thank you and have a great day.